welcome. Uh, Nabil Murad here. I'm with Mike Tulin. Uh, coach Mike is the under-17 head coach of Lippis Celtics, a uh, youth basketball coach with Athlone Basketball Club. We're delighted that he can join us today, and uh, he's going to be talking about team culture. So look, let's 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 get started with day three. Uh, coach, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Nabil, and and thanks to everyone who was uh, who was logged in, and 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 well done to all the speakers who have gone before me. It's, it's a fantastic opportunity, and obviously, given the context, it's it's great for uh, for us to be continuing to learn as we go along. So, as you said, my my topic today is uh, building team culture, and I'm hoping to kind of tailor this towards the Irish context and have some practical takeaways for coaches. So, so hopefully, we'll address some kind of specific challenges uh, throughout. So our content today, we're going to look at the uh, our, our aims of the webinar, uh, the context in which we're, we're talking here in Ireland, um, the uh, philosophy and, and, and how to construct your own philosophy and our definition, uh, the role of the coach in our, in our team culture, uh, process-based approaches and practical applications. And I really want this to be something that's uh, practical for coaches, uh, that they can take something away today that will be, uh, you know, they can action on that in their very next training session. So our aims, as we said, uh, will define team culture. Uh, we're going to outline characteristics of PPP team culture. So this is just a, a positive team culture. Obviously, we can have positive or negative, and positive is, is what we're going for. Uh, we're going to highlight the role of the coach, uh, explain team culture in terms of processes, uh, give practical approaches, as I said, a, a very important uh, thing for me, and to address uh, specific concerns uh, in the Irish context. So we'll talk about some challenges that I feel are unique to Ireland. So uh, what is our context? Well, uh, we want to talk about what, the, what what we're actually mean when we refer to team culture. So scientifically, it's it's referred to in the literature and, and kind of scientific papers. We talk about group cohesion, uh, which is essentially uh, the relationships uh, between players, horizontally between players. Uh, the relationships between coaches and assistant coaches, managers, other staff, uh, and then also uh, how those relationships interact. So between coaches and players and how everyone interacts as a, as a whole. Um, we talk about teams as having uh, common goals, values, and norms or standards. And these are kind of interchangeable, the second bit, uh, in terms of values, norms, and standards. But we'll talk about them a little bit more later on. But the, the common sharing of these is the important thing. And when we have this kind of cohesion and these common goals, uh, it leads to our group mentality and identity. So why are we looking for a positive team culture? Well, well these are some of the benefits and the characteristics of our, our positive professional and performance-based team culture. Um, we're looking for improved communication. Um, so obviously with, with improved communication, we allow players to develop trust between each other. Uh, and this also works uh, from the coach uh, to the players, but also in, in reverse from the players to the coach. Uh, with this uh, increased trust and communication, we're looking to develop independent players. So in, in this context, we mean they, they depend less on the, on the head coach. And now players who are on the court uh, they can make decisions and they now have the tools to implement those decisions. So, you know, the, the ability to communicate them, the trust to actually uh, move as a unit, um, uh, you know, in a decision or, or, or whatever, uh, that's, that's going to be something that we see in, in positive team cultures. Uh, we have better investment in team goals. So when we feel that uh, we're communicating well, we have trust with, with, uh, with each other, um, that we kind of have everybody is involved in the in the team goals and invested in them uh, just that little bit more. Um, and of course, by defining those team goals well and having a collective sense of those goals, uh, we're, we're going to encourage individuals to kind of invest in them. And of course, all of these things we're hoping will, will result in uh, improved performance. And this has been shown in the literature and we'll talk about some of the references uh, later on. So unique challenges. So I wanted to make this practical and, and, and applicable for, for Irish coaches in the kind of grassroots thing. Uh, and I myself now it's coming up on 15 years that I've been coaching um, from the you know from the from the under 18 national team right down to under 12 
locally. And so I do think that this is from talking with other coaches and from my own experience, I think that these are some of the challenges that are faced in the Irish context. So the first one there, I, I assume, hopefully most coaches at home are kind of nodding in agreement, but time with the team. We're, we're incredibly limited in terms of uh, the amount of time we can, we can spend with our team, the amount of time and facilities and the number of games over the course of the season. Uh, facilities there ties in a little bit with the time with the team, you know, the amount of uh, time and, and, and resources we have in uh, gyms, uh, but also, you know, in, in terms of other facilities. Um, I know that they are, they are improving all the time, which is great, uh, but it's still one of the challenges that we face. Uh, attendance and numbers. Uh, I suppose in this context, again, we're thinking in the grassroots kind of Irish context. Uh, I'm sure most, most coaches who maybe have experienced under 12s, maybe under 14s, uh, would be familiar with, you know, we might have uh, 10 players this week and uh, next week we have 20 players and then the week after that we have 20, but they're completely new players. Uh, so uh, this is a this is a challenge that we, we, we see kind of on a weekly basis at that age group. Uh, but of course, um, having numbers at training is a problem, tr is a challenge throughout um, all age groups. Uh, the wide range of abilities. Uh, one challenge that I face quite often is we are at a point where we're three months into a season. Uh, we, we have experienced players. We're playing at a, at a relatively good level. And all of a sudden, we get two new players um, who have never touched a basketball before in their lives. And this is uh, you know, a big challenge. Can we uh, bring them in, completely raw player, um, who maybe is very enthusiastic and wants to be a part of the team, but just we have the challenge of the, the big gap in ability between them and the experienced players, how can we address that? Uh, to a lesser extent, we have inexperienced club staff. Many of us might be taking on assistant coaches or, or encouraging parents to kind of get involved or, or, or managers or, or whatever that, or trying to bring coaches through as well. Uh, that's a, that's a, a, a very, very good thing. And it's a good challenge to try and uh, promote them, encourage them, uh, educate them, but also keep them uh, producing for your team and contributing to that team culture. Uh, the last point I've made here is um, poor understanding of basketball knowledge. Now, what I refer to here as basketball knowledge is uh, what, what I'm kind of meaning is uh, we have the young, the young athletes coming in who are maybe 10, 11, 12, 13 years of age, and they all know uh, Lionel Messi, they all know Cristiano Ronaldo, they all know about other sports. Um, but they might not be as familiar with, say, the NBA, the WNBA, the EuroLeague, and uh, uh, the Super League, the National League, and so on. And I think it's really, really good to foster a kind of a, a appreciation and a little bit of knowledge um, uh, in this regard, because I think that it's going to serve as a kind of a motivational thing uh, for young players. It's something that they can aspire to and look up to. So I do think that that's very important. Some other challenges which I, I don't have here, but um, you know, one thing that we, we, we see is uh, parents, how they interact in the in the in this context. Uh, I'm sure uh, again, most coaches are probably nodding in agreement with uh, that we have that as a challenge. But it's important to view that as a challenge and, and not a problem in your relationship with parents. Uh, and one that we're seeing more and more often now is uh, social media. Uh, social media becoming very very common with with the young players. Uh, with smartphones and so on and that's another challenge that we uh, as coaches will, will, will be facing. So I'll try, uh, we'll address most of these, I won't address all of them due to time constraints today but we will have a, a Q&A at the end so if you have any specific questions about some of these challenges uh, do, do let us know. Okay so um, philosophy, uh, a philosophy I think is you know, probably most people have, have encountered this in almost every clinic, every coaching course. Uh, it's very, very widely covered, but sometimes I think it's not pinned down uh, and not defined very well. So for me, and this is just a personal, uh, a personal thought, uh, but a basketball philosophy is composed of two things. Um, a set of prioritized objectives and the values employed to achieve these objectives. So again, this is just a personal uh, definition tailor it and, and take from it what, what you will. Um, so we'll just, uh, this is an example here of um, John Wooden's Pyramid of Success. Uh, 
widely covered, very, very well known, uh, you know, with, with, with a lot of people. And I think uh, probably one of the best uh, philosophy frameworks um, uh, around. So how are we going to construct our objectives? Now, there's a lot done on objectives and goal setting. So I'm going to go over this quite quickly. But we want to encourage object objectives which are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and timely. So for those of you who, who would be aware of this already, this is the SMART acronym. Um, and there's a lot of material available freely online that I would encourage people to, to look into it a bit more. I think it's been well covered, so I'm not going to uh, address a, a huge amount of this. But I will just say I've put in process based here beside achievable. Um, that's just something I want, you know, I encourage people to focus on again, the process, uh, something that uh, uh, those with the, the 76ers, Sam Hinkey as is, is general manager there, kind of coined this in, in terms of the basketball lexicon. Boys, uh, focusing on the process rather than uh, the outcome, okay, because we have control over the process. Uh, I remember Pat Price mentioned it one time, you know, control the controllables. Uh, really, really try and focus on what you can do rather than something's outside of your control. Last thing I say here is, is group involvement. So try and have group involvement when you're setting these objectives but do not waste time. So what I mean here is that we're not going to spend an hour meeting with a, an under 12 group uh, setting objectives. Okay, under 12 don't have that capability and that's not going to be a productive use of your time. But you should have try and encourage some involvement, whatever it is, and guide them towards the kind of objectives that we want to, that we want to see. Uh, the second part of our philosophy is values. Uh, and values can reflect individual or collective behavior and style of play. So uh, when I refer to uh, individual or collective behavior, the kind of values we might talk about here are, you know, personal responsibility, uh, time management might be a thing, uh, but other maybe less tangible things such as enthusiasm, uh, very, very important. Uh, and, and again, you can tailor your values as you see fit. The second one here is style of play. So we can have uh, certain values which we encourage in terms of our, our playing style. So, you know, some people may prefer uh, up-tempo transition kind of basketball. Uh, that might be one of, your, one of your values in terms of your style of play. And again, these can change depending on the uh, players you have available, the team you're working with, but make sure that you tailor them towards your, um, your setting. So, a lot of people uh, do reference this philosophy, but why is it relevant? Why is it important? Well, for me, a, a well-defined philosophy is going to maintain cohesion and focus on goals. As we said, one of the um, parts of philosophy is, is uh, our set of objectives. And if we have them clearly defined and communicate them well, uh, I think that we're going to obviously encourage players to, to kind of focus on them. It's going to help them focus on that. And it does maintain that cohesion and that focus on, on, on your goals. The second thing, and this is more for you as the coaches, um, you know, if you have a well-defined philosophy, it's going to help you with decision making as issues arise. So, um, it, you know, if you've defend, defined your philosophy well enough, um, you know, if, if, if any issue or any, any uh, problem arises, you should have some sense of idea of, of how we're going to go about addressing this. So, you know, say your, your team bench isn't, has been left unclean, just been left, bottles left on or whatever the case may be. Um, if we have one of our values is personal responsibility, well, now we know we can take action for something like this. And, you know, we can, we can go into more detailed arguments like that. But if we have defined our philosophy well, it kind of helps us and gives us at least a starting point for decision making. What's the role of our coach? So obviously the role of the coach is, is very, very important in establishing team culture. Um, the initial introduction to the team, when you meet the team for the first time, uh, this is a great opportunity to establish team norms. Norms was this phrase we had earlier, but it refers to this kind of unwritten in expectations uh, that players and members of your team are going to have. So uh, the initial introduction, it's very, very important. It's not the be all and end all, okay? But you can, uh, it is a good opportunity for you to make a, a lot of change and kind of start to implement uh, your uh, philosophy and start to initiate this kind of a positive 
team culture. Uh, be a continuous role model. That goes without saying, and, and always as a coach, you will conduct yourself as a, a, a in a way that is uh, acting as a role model. Uh, make extra time, but always end on time. So we're talking here about one of the specific uh, uh, challenges that, that is faced in Ireland, and I've kind of broken this into two um, sections. First of all, make extra time. Uh, be imaginative in how we can create extra time to address the challenge of uh, the amount of time we have with our team. So for example, uh, you know, you only have the gym for one hour. Uh, let's tell our players to arrive 15 minutes early and let's do um, our warm up outside. Uh, you know, it's raining outside. Okay, let's get a ladder. Let's do our warm up inside. Uh, so try and be an imaginative in, in how we actually uh, uh, address this and we create extra time. Uh, and the second part of this is always end on time. And this is something I think uh, we don't emphasize enough. And I, I think it's of really critical importance um, for two reasons. The first I would say is that uh, when we have, uh, when we're ending a training session, uh, we're dealing with, um, you know, our um, key holder, whatever venue you're working in, you have a manager, you have a janitor, um, you know, you have somebody else in the club uh, and they're, they're coming to lock up at the end. This person is critical to your success uh, and uh, the success of your organization. So I think uh, very, very important to, to show them respect. They have a family to go home to that evening. They're probably after a long days of work. So uh, I think it's important to, to make sure you end on time. It's going to avoid conflict with this individual who's so critical to your success. Uh, other stakeholders, there's there are parents, uh, obviously ending on time, very important for them. But also we have, um, if, if you're not the last training session of the day, you're going to have another coach from your club come in. You're going to have uh, maybe a different sport comes in. And I think it's just a good way, uh, if you show respect that way, um, it's a good way of avoiding conflict. I can say from experience that uh, there's nothing more frustrating than watching somebody eating up your time on the court because they haven't finished on time. So sometimes I think it's very, very important. The second uh, uh, benefit to ending on time is that we build a consistency with the players in terms of training. So what I mean here is that if I'm a player and there's 20 minutes uh, to go, but I, you know, I'm not confident in that, we might go over time. So I don't know if there's going to be 20 minutes or two hours left in this training session. I'm going to hold something back, right? I'm not going to spend all my energy in that 20 minutes because we might be going for another two hours. So we need to build that trust with players and that consistency so they know, right, this is a definitive ending point. And so I can expend all my energy, go maximum effort uh, for, for the remainder of this uh, training session and, and really work hard at drills. So I think that's very, very important. Uh, design drills that separate by ability. Uh, and, and this isn't always um, the case, but um, when you have in particular the case of a new player coming in, uh, we want to try and have the ability to uh, separate by ability. So, for example, if we have the newest player coming in who's very inexperienced, hasn't touched a basketball before, and they end up matching up with um, an experienced player, a uh, really, really good player or whatever, you're going to see two things happen. The experienced player is going to get frustrated by, by the, the weaker new player uh, and the, the, the new player is going to be embarrassed, kind of humiliated in front of the group and it's just not going to be a positive experience for them. So that's not going to encourage recruitment into your club. And again, if we're talking about the grassroots level, the under 12s, the under 14s, the under 16s, uh, it's going to be something that's very important to kind of keep some of these players on board. Again, you don't know somebody at 11 years of age that could be, you know, two foot nothing and end up growing up to be uh, seven foot five or something. So, you know, you, you never know what's going to happen with these players. Um, and then praise success in upholding our values. So, you know, really just show that your values are important by praising when somebody is upholding them or has success in these values. Just continuing on with some of this, um, delegate important duties to assistants. So we were saying about how um, uh, you know, uh, we, we may have inexperienced assistants, new assistants, uh, parents who are stepping in, whatever the case may be. Uh, it's good to give them an important duty uh, so that they have an opportunity to learn, but also 
that their status is elevated in front of the players. It's very important that the players understand and respect uh, your assistant coaches and understand that they have an important role to play uh, in the success of your team. So I think that's a good opportunity to, to do some of that. Uh, make every player feel important, but be truthful. So obviously very important to make every player feel, feel important. And in this case, we're probably talking more about the weaker players uh, who might not have as much success on the court. Again, use your values as an opportunity to make them feel important. Praise them in front of their peers. Uh, and that's a real great way of making players who might not get as much court time, uh, you know, making them feel invested in the group uh, feel proud of what they're doing and what they stand for and uh, you know keeping them feeling important and relevant to the group and the last bit of this i've said is but be truthful you know don't don't try and mislead a player uh we've all probably had that conversation with a player who says am i playing at the weekend you know i particularly when they're younger they will come out and ask you am i starting will i be on the team um and it's good i think to be honest and truthful in these um situations but respectful um you know if if you're not if you're misleading with a player if you're not totally honest uh, that's just going to lead to disillusionment and uh, frustration on the part of that player uh, and if you're truthful you're giving them an opportunity to improve in the areas that they need to improve as well so i think it's very important uh, address poor behavior before it escalates again goes without saying make sure nip it nip it in the bud very early and develop and implement positive processes. We're gonna talk about processes in that whole area uh, later on, so we'll address that there. Uh, just put here as well, it's not what you have, it is what you produce uh, that really demonstrates your worth. You know, so again, if you have NBA level players, don't be surprised if you result in an NBA performance. But, you know, if you have under 11 players on a rainy December night in Ballymahan, what are you gonna produce in that context? over and above what you've been given. So that's the real challenge, I think, as coaches. I want to talk about processes here and uh, just explain their role in this. Um, so processes, quite obviously, are multiple steps of tasks, and a process transforms inputs into outputs. I've just given some examples of inputs there. So very basic so far, but I think later on we'll see the, the benefit of looking at things in this way. Uh, so some examples there of inputs as well, philosophy, norms, team experience, experiences, group relationships, and so on. Uh, and this is how we proceed through a process. Obviously, our inputs, uh, I've put objectives and values there, but it could be your philosophy, whatever else it could be. Uh, the process takes place over the course of a season or multiple seasons. And then we have our, our outputs, team culture, and hopefully performance is oriented, is correlated with uh, team culture. So here's where I think processes become a little bit more interesting. Every process is designed to create its output. So if we have an output that was, for example, a, a kind of a toxic team culture, uh, it means that there was some process that led to this point. And so we can see that if the output is not what was desired, the process is likely flawed. And that's your responsibility as a coach to look and say, well, this was the output. What can we, what adjustments can we make to our process? Uh, to to produce a different output. I think that's a nice way of thinking about things. So we like to think of uh, team culture as a process. Uh, we change the inputs to improve the outputs, as we were saying. And we try to have an infinite mindset here. So the infinite mindset is just to, to be aware that this is an ongoing process over an infinite time period. Uh, we don't come and we, you know, we don't win at the weekend at, at, at a team culture you know we haven't won it's continuous and uh you you can think of uh winning in it but make sure you think of it in a continuous way that it's an infinite uh timeline and that we keep working on this continuous process and again there we have just some athletes make excuses but we think that great athletes make adjustments make adjustments to your process to improve the output and here we get into some of the practical stuff and i think the real takeaway stuff from today so um, no players individually. So these are practical processes that we, we carry out um, with, with our teams and, and, and try to improve team culture. Uh, knowing players individually, uh, fairly, fairly self-evident, fairly obvious, but um, make sure that you do have a little bit of detail about each player individually um, and, and just a little bit you know, about them that's maybe unique. 
uh, note positive actions and revisit later. Uh, so I generally you know, have a practice plan or a scrap of paper or a notebook, and we just jot down positive actions which we may not be able to um, to uh, action straight away. So we may not be able to praise uh, some positive action immediately, uh, but make sure we note that for later. Uh, in Hey guys, we seem to be having um, we seem to be having a little bit of an issue there with Coach Mike. Uh, I think his internet just dropped there for a second. We'll see if we can get him back on. Just play with us I'm, for one. I'm just second. back. Sorry about that, Coach. Uh, I there just got is. back in there. You're good. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Keep going. Great. Sorry about that, guys. So um, as we were saying, we we always communicate the truth. So I think that's where we we, we stopped off on this on this page. So um, I was just saying, as as we say, always communicate the truth. Uh, make sure that we um, are honest with players, as we mentioned earlier on. Uh, have themes or phrases that capture your philosophy. It's just a good way of communicating it. Makes your philosophy memorable, and it kind of sticks in the imagination of players. Last thing I have here is communicate big ideas with few words. Uh, really be, sh be, be short, be concise uh, with what you're communicating. One of the exercises I do with my assistants is we, um, we actually time, uh, we, will, we will time how much time I spend speaking in a training session. And universally, I'm shocked. It, it's always way longer than what I thought. And so we really try, it's all, you know, try and shorten that time, get more reps for players, get them more active. Uh, so really try to reduce that speaking time. Now, training day processes. So something we do every training session. Uh, speak to each player before training. Um, you know, we've, we've a sign-in book for the underages. Uh, it's a good opportunity because every, obviously each uh, player signs in individually. So uh, it gives us an opportunity to engage with that player. And this isn't just, hi, how are you? You know, this is, hi, Sarah. How was your week? Uh, you know, did you have a school game? Um, how you know did you have a lot of homework this whatever the case may be but we're just engaging the player a little bit more than just uh you know hi how's it going um we mentioned every player's name in the first 15 minutes uh something i picked up on the irish team with paul kelleher actually um and we would we would just uh use the first 15 minutes to engage every player by by calling their name um, and it just acts as a kind of a trigger mentally for them and, and gets them engaged, gets them in, in the process. Uh, obtain regular and constant feedback. Uh, this feedback may be uh, verbal from players, but also watch for uh, body language, watch for nonverbal feedback, uh, and be kind of keeping an eye out for this all the time. Um, you know, and again, you can use that feedback to kind of tailor your process, adjust things slightly. And use every opportunity to engage with players. So, you know, if you're scrimmaging at the end and, and, and players are out on the sideline, you know, let's start talking to them. Uh, I like to, when the guys are warming up, I like to jog up and down uh, and we get a conversation with one of them. Then maybe when they're warming down, when they're stretching, use all of these opportunities. Don't let them go to waste. Continuing on with some of our training day processes, uh, conduct every drill with a teammate. So very often I'll see coaches, they will send people out for free throws go to all the baskets in, in, in the gym. Uh, let's send two players instead of just one. You know, basketball is a team game. Uh, let's make sure we're working with a teammate all the time uh, and that we have that opportunity for a social interaction and, and a relationship and trust and communication all to build up as well. 
Uh, develop links between the players. Again, use these kind of opportunities of small groups uh, for the players to allow the players to build up links between each other. And that's going to, again, reduce dependency on, on the head coach a little bit. Uh, have values that teach good communication. Again, show that communication is important. Uh, monitor implementation of the group's philosophy. And, and here I really mean show that you're moving towards uh, your goals, that you're making progress as a group, that you're not being stagnant. You know, it's very, very important, even at the youngest ages, to show that they're improving and that they're moving towards this kind of goal. And the last one here, learn and develop the player's individual goals. So we have uh, in this in this kind of uh, um, context, you know, we, we might learn a little bit about the, their individual goals. And what we want to try and do is when we say develop, we mean try and guide them towards goals that are going to fit into the wider group goals. So in some cases, you know, in, in, in poor cultures, in, in, in kind of more toxic cultures, we see that the player's individual goals contradict those of the group overall. Your job as a coach is you're going to be, your duty of care is towards the group. And so it's important to, um, to, to you know, act on that and to try and guide uh, players' individual goals in that direction. Uh, new player processes. So when we have, a, again, one of the challenges we talked about was, was when you have a new player, maybe in the middle of the season, very, very common uh, thing. How do we address uh, new players and how do we kind of integrate them into the group? Uh, one thing which I find amazing, it, teach new players how to introduce themselves. Um, and this is, I'm talking about this in terms of from under 10, under 8, up to senior, up to senior level. Um, I've seen grown men and women um, you know, sh shake hands and avoid eye contact, turn away from the person they're trying to introduce themselves to, you know, and that to me is a red flag immediately, you know, it, it, at best, this person lacks confidence. So I think it's very important to teach that at a young age and give them an opportunity to practice and actually understand what it is. So, you know, you're shaking hands, making eye contact, firm handshake, not too hard, uh, you know, my name is such and such and, and, and pleased to meet you and so on. So I think that's important to teach that. Uh, I personally avoid name tags. Uh, maybe now when you have a very, very big group for the first time, that might be appropriate. For me, um, I avoid name tags, but I insist on learning a player's name. And this means that now we get the, we do learn player names, but we get the bonus, bonus social interaction of going over to somebody and say, well, you know, what's your name? Learning somebody's name. If we have name tags, I can just look at the name tag and I know who I'm talking to and, and that. So it's kind of an easy way out and it just gives us a, that bonus interaction that we, we, we're looking for. Um, place new players in small groups. Uh, very hard for a new player who's arrived in a club uh, to um, learn 30 people's names and build relationships with 30 people uh, simultaneously. Uh, try and put them into small groups to give them an opportunity to bond with, with people on a, on a smaller smaller scale. Uh, engage with throughout training. So obviously, uh, again, obtain feedback from from new players and and make sure that you're uh, you're you're kind of uh, monitoring their their um, uh, body language again. Make sure they're enjoying themselves and all that kind of stuff. So you want to make sure you recruit this player. Encourage experienced players to welcome new ones. Uh, this is something I've seen in action. I've experienced actually, and uh, one one of the it, it's really uh, quite impressive when you see like a star player you know, or an experienced player or somebody who's, who's well known on the team and they're the first ones to put the foot forward and to welcome a new player. It really just makes your, your team, your culture, a real welcoming environment. So I would have a quiet word with, with some of our leaders and say, look, uh, this is a new person. His name is, you know, uh, Stephen. Her name is Mary. Um, go over and introduce yourselves and, and, and introduce them to more of the group. So I think it's a really, really nice way of, of introducing people to the group and build confidence by providing a safe environment. Again, ties in a little bit to what we said earlier on, but uh, you know, don't put the spotlight on the new player immediately. Uh, don't put the new player marking the most experienced player in your group, okay? Give them that safe environment to build a little bit of confidence and then integrate them, you know, and for sure challenge them. Don't give them an easy, an easy way out, but uh, get that initial confidence uh, before you go to that stage. So obviously most of us are dealing with, with relatively experienced players. And when I say experienced players, I, I mean, you know, players who may have been, who've been with you over the course of the season uh, or longer, of course. 
Um, so we look to continue to challenge them and keep training fresh. Okay, so uh, you know, tr try and go on on a weekly basis or uh, and, and provide new challenges for these players um, to to kind of uh, keep them focused in that way and motivated. Uh, and keep training fresh. Don't don't keep rehashing the same drills uh, week after week. Try and freshen it up, even if it's just slightly. Um, and again, you, you know, you can repeat a training session maybe for a, a couple of sessions, but again, you know, uh, try and find that balance between teaching, uh, teaching um, drills, uh, uh, you know, getting reps and introducing new things to keep things fresh. Encourage leadership, give opportunities for experienced players to show leadership. So the example we gave earlier was uh, when you go over and introduce yourself to a new player and you're kind of welcoming them to the group. But also uh, we want to see that you know, look for other opportunities for them to show leadership. So, for example, uh, let a player lead a timeout. Um, you know, uh, ask them to, um, you know, make, make a sub or to to uh, to choose a play or to take an inbounds. You know, whatever the case may be, but give them opportunities to show leadership, even at a very young age, even at under 12s. Uh, give them that opportunity. Uh, continuously look for clicks and destroy them. Uh, very, very important. Uh, but a little bit tricky, um, and uh, what we need to do first of all is how do we identify a click. Um, generally, for for me, uh, you might see groups of people who like to hang out together. That might not necessarily be a click. Uh, I think, in, in my experience, a click forms when you see exclusion. So when people start to be excluded from activities or from groups, and so that's why it's very important to be watching body language be watching players when they're off the court how they conduct themselves uh, and again you want to destroy them there's a number of ways try and try and find the solution to to clicks and, and move players about a bit mix players often to move them out of comfort zones okay again we can get into a comfort zone um you know i might go to the same school as um you know danny so i always want to train with him i always want to do my drills with him whatever the case may be Try and move them about a little bit, get them out of the comfort zone. Uh, establish team traditions in downtime. Uh, we actually had a funny tradition with our under 18 team this year. We would play um, the car game Uno before training. Um, and it was just a little opportunity to let off a little bit of steam, have a little bit of fun. And it actually became a tradition then. So we did it before uh, big games. If, if the players were a little bit nervous, this was a great way of just relaxing them would actually play play a, a, a car game before training. But having those little fun games, ending training on a positive note with a fun game, very, very important. And we just come out of training. Remember that as the players leave, um, the last thing they've experienced is the one that's going to be most in their minds afterwards. When they look back on the training session, it's probably going to be the last event of the training session that sticks out. So try and make that a positive one. Uh, and so we've we've come to our conclusion there. So, um, uh, you know, a, a positive team culture improves group performance. Again, it's kind of shown in literature and we'll have a couple of references here in a second. Um, our well-defined philosophy uh, begins and initiates a positive team culture. The coach has a vital role, obviously, in creating a positive team culture. And hopefully you can use some of the processes that we discussed, you know, for, for new players, for experienced players, um, uh, and kind of training processes to kind of start to to see that positive team culture. Uh, and when we use this process-based approach, uh, we're hoping that it will improve uh, results. Um, so, so those are some ideas hopefully we've given you. So hopefully you can take away some practical things straight away um, in how to engage with players, how to build relationships, different opportunities to to do that, uh, but also the tools of how to build on this knowledge uh, by using processes, okay, and to reflect on uh, the processes that we do on a, on, on a daily basis, on a training basis, uh, and on a season by season basis. Um, and then I just have uh, a few references there for anyone who wants to reference them uh, from throughout. Um, and I think that we've managed to finish just about a little bit over so um hopefully there's a, if, if there's any questions again you can send them in uh i know nabil is receiving them so um if, if you have any for a q a i'm certainly happy to try and address them as best as I can. 
that, that's some really good stuff, Coach. Uh, really, really practical examples, and I think everybody's going to benefit by, you know, by having actual things that they can they can go off and do. I just wanted to kind of open up the questions there for yourself. Uh, let me start by asking you. You mentioned about giving leadership opportunities to your players. What are some of the challenges that you have found uh, with doing this? Um, yeah, that's a great that's a great question. Um, well, some of them uh, sometimes we we've, we've chosen maybe uh, inadvertently uh, personnel who maybe aren't suited towards um, these uh, kind of leadership opportunities. So, for example, uh, you you might be putting undue stress on a player if you ask them to stand in front of the group and conduct a timeout. And again, you little bit, this is where the feedback comes in. This is where knowing each individual player comes in and a little bit of experience in dealing with these um, uh, as well. But uh, you need to understand, will, you, will a player be uh, capable uh, at this point of um, taking a leadership position, of leading a timeout? You know, are they confident? And again, you need to look at their body language how they interact with the group are they vocal are they able to communicate do they have good ideas and even just you you can ask them uh you can engage with them to say how would you like to conduct this time out and you know they, they they their response will at least give you some kind of an indication as to uh whether they're in a position so i would say that one of, one of the biggest challenges i i i've felt uh in terms of kind of giving these leadership opportunities is uh is, is that one is you know are they themselves individually ready uh, to take this is it an undue burden on this individual uh, and the second thing i found is just making sure that there's respect in the group so this isn't something that i would do on the first day of an under 12s season uh, this is something that uh, when we've built up the discipline of the group when we have good team culture and respect between individuals uh, this is something that we can now experiment with and look at the results and again if it's not what you wanted then there's something wrong with your process and you need to go back uh, and maybe build up more confidence or instill more more respect between players or, or whatever the case may be fantastic really appreciate that uh, let me just quickly ask you something else there before we kind of move on to coach uh, cookson you, you also talked about kind of giving uh, and i know this is something we've talked about previously but giving assistant coaches uh, an opportunity to lead and stuff so you mentioned some of the things if you had a new assistant coach coming in to your program what would be some of the things that you would actually give him almost straight away or give him or her sorry almost straight away and to empower them and obviously to gain um, credibility in the players eyes yeah great question again um with that, I, I would try and initiate, um, you know, I try to have a little conversation with, with the uh, assistant before we, we jump into anything. Because um, again, in the same way, uh, in the same challenge we just talked about in terms of leadership for the, uh, for the players, uh, the same thing applies to assistant coaches. So if they're coming in and they're, they're maybe not the most confident just yet, let's, let's give them an opportunity to build up that confidence. And again, hopefully they will communicate that to you uh, before you kind of get involved. So I would you know, ha have a little conversation with um, assistant coaches before you start. Uh, things that are normally, um, you know, very good for assistants to to, to start off with are, are warm-ups. You can even ask them, what's your favorite drill? You know, and it might not be something that you are going to put into the training session, but to give your assistant an opportunity, uh, something that they're very confident with, uh, you might put it in for a couple of training sessions. So now they're getting used to it. Uh, I would give some information to my assistant to pass on to the team. So, for example, if we're planning a season and we say, OK, we've got a big cup game in two weeks, I would say uh, you communicate that to the team um, and, and you say this. So now when we have the group all together with the team, the time out and the huddle uh, or sorry, at, at the start of practice or the start of the season, uh, then we, when the assistant is communicating important information to the group, it's very easy for the assistant to do this. And again, it's elevating uh, the assistant in the eyes of the players because they have something important to communicate. So the players are kind of thinking, oh, I, I should listen to this person. They have important information and clearly their input is valued and important to us. So, so that's it. So again, it will be a little bit contextual in terms of where the assistant is at themselves, how experienced they are. 
but also you know there's there's some examples uh, a warm up get some feedback from the assistant themselves in terms of what they would like to do uh, and also just very simply communicating items communicating uh, information uh, with the team so i think it's important for them to speak to the team early early on uh, to show their importance amazing stuff fantastic and uh, obviously coach uh, coach Tulin is going to stay with us until the end uh, after ash's presentation so anybody who's got any questions uh, for coach just fire them away either tweet them to us we'll be able to answer them or just send them over here through this platform and we'll be sure to look after that too